finding the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter number 6. Probably uh, one of our favorite characters in the Word of God. For those of you that have been in church, raised in church, been to Sunday school or vacation Bible school, you love the stories that we find in the first half of the book of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel and the lion's den. I mean, what wonderful, wonderful stories of faith, wonderful stories of the power of God, wonderful stories of, of realizing that when we are in the midst of a trial, when we are, are facing uh, trials, uh, they're, they're face to face with us. We know that our God is able to deliver us. And as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, even if he chooses not to deliver us from the fire, he gets in the fire with us. I don't know about you, but I'm glad about that. Amen? I told them uh, in revival this past week in Psalm 55 in verse 22, the Bible speaks, the psalmist speaks of casting our burden and our care on him because in the midst of it, he will sustain us. Now we know that God, if he wants to, that he can sweep that burden away. He can sweep that trial away. He's powerful enough. He does do that. But you know what? There's something spectacularly sweet when he just settles down beside, beside us and sustains us in the midst of that burden. Well, I hadn't planned on saying that, but I just thought about it. As you're turning, uh, Daniel chapter number 6. I want you to stand in honor and reverence to the reading of God's inspired and errant word. I want to thank you again for your cooperation. This is a good looking 430 crowd. Thank you so much. Let's read the first three verses and we'll kind of make our way through the first 11. But let's look at the first three. And I want to speak to you tonight on this subject. What do they see when people look at me? What do they see when people look at me? The Bible says it pleased Darius to set over the kingdom and 120 princes, which should be over the whole kingdom. And over these three presidents, of whom Daniel was first, that the princes might give accounts unto them, and the king should have no damage. Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes, because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king thought to set him over the whole realm. And then we'll carry on in verse 4 in a moment. Father, we love you. Thank you for this wonderful music tonight. Lord Jesus, I pray now as we dive into your word and study your word, God, I, I pray, Lord, that we would be challenged in our walk tonight as believers. Lord, most in here tonight are committed to you. Most in here on this Sunday night love you and are living for you. And Lord, I just pray that this would be uh, just another challenge to us, Lord, to, to hold the fort. Lord, to, to just keep being faithful and standing true to you and your name. And certainly, Lord, we would pray if there be one anyone in here tonight that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior of their life. God, I pray that the Holy Spirit's already working on their heart. Lord, that they might come and be saved this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. You know, and uh, we know that, especially when we watch TV, I love, uh, I love TV commercials. I, I love uh, the, the, I believe it's the Geico commercials with uh, the, little, the little gecko. I also love the progressive commercials. What's, what's the lady's name on the progressive? Flo. I love Flo, man. She is, she's awesome. But you know, businesses often use slogans as a means of advertising or, or creating a, a certain reputation with the public. Just a few. Bake, the bakery says, it's nice to be needed. <laughs> a car dealership, listen to this. The best way to get back on your feet Miss a car payment. <laughs> the computer store. Out for a quick bite. Those of you that know about computers. Operating, operating room entrance. The ER. May I cut in? <laughs> the undertaker's, undertaker's window. Drive carefully. We can wait. Amen. And then my favorite, the waterbed shop. This is your vinyl resting place. Amen. <laughs> As Christians, 
I just believe that it is so important how others view us and the kind of reputation that we have and the kind of uh, reputation that we give off. Uh, do they see a, a negative influence in me of Christianity? Do they, do they see a negative example of Christianity in me? You know, there are a lot of people, and we've heard this said for many, many years, but could it be that there are some people who... In part, now I know every single person has to make a decision for Jesus Christ themselves, but could it be in part one day that someone would be able to look at the example that you and I set before them and they saw no example of Jesus Christ in our life and maybe that was one of the reasons they chose to reject Christianity in this life. A non-Christian lawyer uh, attended a church service and he listened to the, listened to the testimonies of, of some who were known to him for their shady deals and for their failure to meet their honest obligations. And so the man who had invited him nudged him in the service and said, how did you like the testimonies? And the, the lawyer replied this. He said, to a lawyer, there's a vast difference between testimony and evidence. You know what, unfortunately, there are those who profess to be Christians, but there's little evidence they are, they are Christians are showing the Christ-like example in their life. You know, lost people look at, often look at such Christians and use them far as an excuse either not to go to church or not to come to faith in Christ. A pastor was witnessing to a lady one time and she mentioned a certain person, a person that went down to the church, a person that, that uh, maybe she could sit with at the church. And the lady he asked said this, Oh, is she a Christian? The pastor replied, She says she is. And the lady responded, Well, if she's a Christian, then I'm a Christian. Wow. Do they see in me a negative example of Christianity or do they see in me a biblical example of Christianity? I, I read a story that comes from uh, uh, Jerry McCauley's Bowery Mission. Bowery Mission. Uh, one night, the invitation was given for all those who wanted to become Christians there in the mission. And down the aisle, there came a bum. And when he knelt to pray, a man by the name of S.H. Hadley knelt by him. He was already praying, the, the bum was already praying, and here's what his prayer consisted of. It was just one sentence. He repeated this sentence over and over and over. He was saying, dear Lord, make me like Joe. Dear Lord, make me like Joe. He just kept repeating that, and Hadley interrupted him and said, ask God to make you like Jesus. And that bum opened up his eyes and looked over at Hadley, and, and he said, well, was Jesus any better than Joe? Everybody on the Bowery knew who Joe was and, and loved him. He had been converted and he had dedicated his life to his Lord two years before. And only Jesus knows how many men Joe had led to Christ. Joe had been buried that afternoon and the bums of the Bowery wept all day long. It's Christians who have testimonies like Joe that will touch this world for Jesus Christ. It's such Christians that help enlarge the kingdom of God. Those types of Christians do not hinder the cause of Christ. Well, Daniel in our Bible had a wonderful Christian testimony. I wish we had time to, to look at his life. And we may go back and do that. But from the very beginning of the book of Daniel, we see him as an excellent example of a Christian to a pagan world. An excellent example of what it means to live Christ-like in a uh, dying and lost world. What it means to live Christ-like in an unchrist-like world. Well, what does Daniel show us? Well, here's what I want you to write down. Number one, I want you to notice that Daniel's life was contagious. He had a contagious life. Look at it. The Bible says, It pleased Darius, verse 1, to set over the kingdom and 120 princes which should be over the whole kingdom. Now, if you go back to, to, to chapter 5, Daniel chapter 5 <coughs> closes by telling you and me that Darius the Median took the kingdom being about three score and two years old. Now, most believe that Darius, archaeologists believe that there, there was some, some question uh, in, in history whether the, this man by the name of Darius ever lived. Well, archaeologists tell us that, uh, that Darius is most likely a person known in history by another name, the name Gubaru, whom Cyrus appointed to be governor over Babylon uh, immediately after the fall of the city. 
The Bible tells us that once he assumed control over Babylon, he organized a form of government in which he placed 120 men over the affairs of his kingdom. That word princes in, in verse 1 is often translated, and you may see this in your Bible, satrap, S-A-T-R-A-P. It means protector of the kingdom. Because of the Persian Empire's vast size, it was the largest in the world at that time. It was divided into many smaller territories over which these princes or these satraps govern. Over these 120, Darius set three men. One of those men being Daniel. Now notice verse number 2. The Bible says, and over these, over who? These 120 princes, over these three presidents. Now that word president, it speaks of what we would call an administrator. And so Darius has set up a government with levels of authority among those who carried out his will. So we read in verse number 2 that the 120 princes, here's what they do, that they might give accounts Unto these three presidents, the 120 leaders in the kingdom possessed great authority in their position, but they were under the authority of the three presidents that Darius placed as his administrators. Now, we also read in verse 2 that of these three presidents, Daniel was first. Of the three, Daniel was the highest in rank. There was no one in the kingdom that held a higher place than Daniel, with the exception of Darius. He's second only to Darius. Verse 2 tells us why these particular men were chosen. They were to see that the king should have no damage. Now, what does that mean? That means they were to see that Darius didn't suffer damage or loss. And so these satraps were responsible to see that the taxes were collected properly and so that no one was stealing from the king. Now, there's a reason that Daniel was chose as the first of these three. First of all, he was a man who was preferred. He was preferred. Notice what the Bible says in verse 3. Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king thought to set him over the whole realm. You know what that word preferred means? It means to become chief. It means eminent. It comes from a root word that means to glitter from afar. In a land of darkness, in a pagan kingdom of darkness, Daniel was glimmering like a light. His Christian example shone brightly in a dark world. Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And that is exactly, long before the Lord Jesus ever said that, that is exactly what Daniel was doing. He was letting his light shine before men. And you know what happened? They saw his good works. And then a decision was made by Darius to put a man over his kingdom. When he made that decision, Daniel was preferred. You know, if you go to a jewelry store, men, when you go to the jewelry store at Christmas time this year and you're looking to get your wife a, a new diamond, you, you know what they'll do in that jewelry store? Uh, they'll usually lay those, darn, those diamonds under a bright light on a black or a dark background. Why? It's because the brilliance of the diamonds shows more clearly against a dark background. The Bible speaks of how the lost of this world walk in darkness. A Christian like Daniel shines even brighter in such darkness. You know, we talk about sometimes, and I've heard folks say that uh, when they're talking about the environment in which they work, they're, they're burdened, and, and they say, you know, I believe that I'm the only Christian there on my job. Now listen, that is often the case for a Christian, but it gives them, it gives you a wonderful opportunity to show Shine your light for Jesus Christ. Look at it this way. God has allowed me the privilege to be in this dark place to be a shining light for Him. Amen? He was a man preferred, but he was also perceived. One of the things about Daniel that was noticed, in, according to verse 3, is that an excellent spirit was in him. Darius saw something in Daniel that distinguished him from everybody else. Man, that, 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 uh, that challenges me. That convicts me. He saw something in Daniel that separated him from everybody else. He was not only a skilled and able leader, but there was something about Daniel's spirit. 
spirit. That word excellent, it speaks of his skill and ability, but the word spirit speaks of how he approached all that he did. He has an excellent spirit. He was the kind of person who gave nothing less, whatever he was doing, he gave nothing less than his best. And so it's easy to understand why Darius chose Daniel above all others. Listen to me tonight, Blue Ridge View. I believe this. If there is any person on a job that ought to give their best and do their best, it ought to be the Christian on the job. Christians ought to be distinguished from all others by their honesty, by their hard work, and by their behavior. You know what Christians do? Christians pay their bills. They, they pay their taxes. They abide by the law. They do not cheat the system. Amen? The way a Christian behaves in all situations determines what kind of testimony that they're going to have to those who are around them. If a Christian has a terrible spirit, obviously it's going to hurt their testimony. But on the other hand, if a true believer has an excellent spirit, it gives one a testimony that attracts others to him. So there was something about Daniel that attracted him to others. Something contagious about his life. He caught the eye of others. He, he impressed others. He didn't turn people away by how he lived. You know, if we're not careful, we can do that. Even as believers, we can turn people away by how we live. I wonder, as Christians, do we live in such a way that others are attracted to us? Is there anything in our lives that stand out from the world that are recognized by others who are examining our lives? Does the way we live convince the lost that come into contact with us that our faith is real, but even more important, that Christianity makes a difference? Man, I want people who come into contact with me and, and, and know that I'm a believer. I want them to see that Christianity makes a difference in my life. Not just something I say, but it's something that I want. Oftentimes, the reason people are not drawn to what we, uh, what we profess is because they know us. Oh, me? We may talk the talk, but the real issue is whether or not we walk the walk. And so people saw in Daniel the real deal and they were attracted by what his faith was contagious. Uh, but second of all, I want you to notice this. Daniel's life was consecrated. And there's a word we don't use much anymore. The word consecrated. Very simply, very simply, Daniel lived a clean life. Well, that's hard in the day in which we live. Amen. Let's just be honest. That's hard in the day in which we live. I mean, the devil throws everything that he can in front of us, behind us, beside us, and beside us on the other side to get us not to live clean lives. The world, for the most part, are watching Christians. Paul said of himself and the disciples in 1 Corinthians 4, he said, we are made a spectacle unto the world. That word spectacle gives us our word theater. It literally means a place of public showing. So the world is the stage on which the Christian walks and the audience is the world that is around us. I wonder if any of us would win an Oscar for the testimony that we have. Listen to verse number 4. Then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find none occasion nor fault for as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault in him. So, so here's the context. Here's the scenario. Listen to this. Most likely motivated by jealousy, the other presidents, the other two presidents, and then the 120 princes, they watched Daniel like a hawk. I mean, they wanted to see his every move, every action, every deed, every word was under constant scrutiny. Do you remember in, in uh, 2007, Larry Flint, who uh, uh, publishes pornography, he took out a full-page ad, or published pornography, he took out a full-page ad in the Washington Post, and here was his question. He said, have you had a sexual encounter with a current member of the United States high-ranking government official, or a high-ranking government official? In that ad, he offered $1 million if anybody could provide documentation of that affair. Well, don't you know there were some government officials who were shaking in their boots? 
I've often wondered that. Listen, I'm sure that these presidents and princes, they took every step they could to dig up some dirt on Daniel, but the Bible says they could find none occasion nor fault, and neither was there any error or fault found in him. I mean, Daniel was as clean as he could be. He was clean as some say he was clean as a hound's tooth. Now, how was he clean? Well, first of all, professionally. Daniel was clean professionally. Verse 4 says, They sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom. Professionally, he was clean. They looked at his job record, if you will. They tried to find something in how he handled the king's affairs. So maybe they hired auditors to audit the financial records. They scrutinized the decisions that he had made. They scrutinized every order he gave. They tried to find something that they could use against him. I, I once read, and this is hard to believe, but I once read that 30% of all business failures each year are a direct result of internal theft, according to the insurance statistics. Fraud is a major factor in losses that led to the closing of 100 banks during a 20-year period. Criminals from inside and outside of business stores are dragging off $40 billion annually in lost cash and goods. That's 17% of total business income before taxes. Many stores lose 50% of their profits to unaccountable inventory shrinkage. Generally believed to be fair. Security officials estimate that 9% of all employees, 9% steal on a regular basis. And 75% of all employees in retail establishments steal to some degree, taking three times as much as shoplifters. Now, I'm going to tell you what's sad about that. What's sad is many times it's Christians or church members who are involved who see nothing wrong with it. Not in Daniel's case. When they looked at Daniel, they couldn't find one area in which he'd been dishonest. There was no fraud there. He had not cheated the king out of one single dime. The books were perfect. He'd not mismanaged one thing in the kingdom. He was clean professionally. But notice also, privately, Daniel was clean. Privately, he was clean. Verse 4 says, Neither was there any error or fault found in him. I mean, they evidently scrutinized every aspect of his life. Not just public, but also private. I don't know if they had private investigators back then, but man, they kept somebody on down. We hear people say that what they do in their private life is their own business. Well, as far as Daniel was concerned, his private life was as clean as his public life. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 15, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world. You see, the world should not be able to point a finger at anything in the Christian's life that would be dishonoring to God and hurtful to the cause of Christ. In Birmingham, Alabama, many years ago, there lived a Presbyterian pastor. His name was James Bryan. Throughout the city, he was known as Brother Brian. Uh, there were many preachers stronger in pulpit oratory, but none preached better sermons than he did with his life. Like Jesus, he went about doing good. It was a common thing for him to come home on a cold day without his coat. He'd given it to some poor man somewhere. One spring day, he was driving a horse and buggy through the countryside, and he, he saw a farmer standing dejectedly in the field. It was time for his spring plowing, but his only horse lay dead. You know what Brother Brian did? You guessed it. He unhitched his horse. He gave it to the man. Then he walked home. It was fitting that when his biography was written years later, it was called, Brother Brian, A Sermon in Shoes. I want to tell you what, Christians ought to be sermons in shoes. Amen? You read the book of James. You know what the book of James is? It's practical Christian living. I call it uh, Christianity in shoe leather. Our lives should be an example both publicly and privately. If someone put out a reward to dig up dirt on us, we should live in such a way that it would be a total waste of time and a total waste of money. Amen? Amen. Daniel's life was contagious. Daniel's life was consecrated. But last of all, notice that Daniel's life was committed. 
found in verses 5 through 11. Daniel was a consistent, committed follower of God. Verse 4 says Daniel was faithful. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 2, moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found what? Be found faithful. So Daniel is a man who has been found faithful. He was faithful to his God. He had a faithful testimony. And we see that wonderfully exemplified in verses 5 through 11. First of all, I want you to notice the testimony of his faith. Look at, look at verse number 5. The Bible says, Then said these men, We shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Now what, what a statement. The princes looked for anything they could to discredit Daniel. And there was only one area in which they could come up with something. The only way they could find a conflict between Daniel and the Persian government, the only conflict they could come up with was his commitment to Almighty God. What about that? <laughs> That's the only thing that they could, that they, they could find in his life. So they knew that if they found anything, it would be where his faith ran contrary to the Babylonian government, to the Babylonian religion. What a testimony to the kind of Christian life Daniel lived. You know what? You looked at Daniel and you got to know him. You could not divorce Daniel from his faith. I mean, when you got around Daniel, when you saw Daniel, it was like you were in the very presence of God. I mean, he was a godly man. You ever been in the presence of somebody like that? I mean, you just, you just leave their presence and you know, you know what? That man, that woman, they've been with God. You ever been around anybody like that? I mean, they just ooze righteousness and godliness. That's how Daniel was. When Daniel came to your mind... God came to your mind. You could not explain him apart from his faith. And so it was his faith that made him who and what he was. Daniel was not a part-time Christian. He was completely a full-time believer. He was a Christian through and through, and all around him knew that he was such a man. Now, there's an old Italian proverb, I love this, that says, every cask smells of the wine it holds. Daniel gave forth the aroma of a 100% Christian. All right, the testimony of his faith, but I want you to notice the test of his faith. The test, the reality of Daniel's faith was revealed when it was tested. And you know, sometimes that's how our faith is revealed. Do you know that? When our faith is put to the test. It's one thing to stand up in church and talk about the kind of Christian we are, but it's quite another thing when our faith is put to the test. You can really tell the depth of a person's faith when that faith is put to a test in this life. So the princes, they could not find anything in Daniel's public or private life, and so they came up with a plan to get rid of him. They came up with a plan to get him in trouble, to get him arrested, to get him thrown in the lion's den. All right, keep reading now. Look what the Word of God says in verse 6. Then these presidents and princes... Assembled together to the king and said thus unto him, King Darius, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors and the princes, the counselors and the captains have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for 30 days, save of thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish this decree Sign the writing that it, may, that it be not changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. Wherefore, King Darius signed the writing and the decree. So the idea here is to appeal to the ego of the king. And you know what? Men like that, we love to have our egos stroked. Now, men, if you're in here today, you say, not me. You're a liar, Okay. <laughs> They made the recommendation that he pass a law that stated for 30 days no man can ask anything of any man or God except the king. They recommended that the penalty for breaking this law would result in that person being thrown into a den of lions. Now, we all love to have our ego stroked. Darius was no different. They pretended to be thinking about Darius when all the time they were trying to get Daniel. The king heard them out. He signed into law their recommendation. These men, 
these men knew Daniel well enough to know that he's not going to let 30 days pass, much less 30 minutes go by without seeking the face of his God. And they were absolutely correct in that assumption. Amen. Keep reading verse 10 and 11. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did afford. I, I just love how matter of fact that is. He doesn't go to the window and look around. He doesn't go to a back uh, corner of his, his bedroom. Just matter of fact, as his custom was, three times a day, he gets down and he kneels and gives thanks before his God as he did aforetime. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and makes, making supplication before his God. Daniel's, please hear me tonight. Daniel's Christian life was not predicated on whether or not it was popular or convenient. Now, could I say that again? Daniel's Christian life was not predicated on whether or not it was popular or convenient. He had a faith in God all the time. And he knew the consequences of keeping his regular prayer time, but his faith governed all he did and all he was. Therefore, Daniel did not blink an eye or hesitate to seek the face of his God in prayer. That means when everybody else was going one way, Daniel was going the other way because it was God's way. It didn't matter what his friends thought. It didn't matter what the government thought. Daniel was true to his faith. He was true to his God. He did not care who knew it, and he did not care about the consequences. He was standing for God. I'm thankful. I'm thankful now I live in a country where we have the privilege of the free exercise of one's religion. But let's just think about it. What if a law were passed that made it illegal to read the Bible or meet together as the church? And if we did, we would be put in jail. I think that would probably thin the ranks down a little bit. I, I believe it would. Matter of fact, I, I know sometimes we're bold and say, well, I, I'd still pray. I'd, I'd still bow down. And we don't make it a regular practice now. Amen? <laughs> Throughout church history, and I'm closing, many have been required to make a stand when it came to their faith. Some have been required to pay the ultimate price. Patrick Hamilton of Scotland. He was burned at the stake in 1527 in St. Andrews, Scotland. Before the fire was lit, he said this, and I quote. Now, before he's about to burn to death, he said, As to my confession, I will not deny it for all of your fire. Or in all of your fire. For my confession and belief is in Jesus Christ. I will rather be content that my body burn in this fire for confession of my faith in Christ than to have my soul burn in the fire of hell for denying the same. <laughs> yes, Amen? That's the kind of faith Daniel had. And it's the kind of faith that when people look at us, they ought to see in us. It's a kind of faith that is not for sale. It's the kind of faith that does not waver when it's put to the test. Uh, I saw Nevaeh up there. Miss Diana, was, the choir was singing and she was standing beside Ronnie. And, uh, I saw her when that song came on. It's just a marching song and she started doing this and she caught herself. I kind of like that. I wanted to look up there and say, you keep on doing that. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner. It must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall he lead till every foe is vanquished and Christ is Lord indeed. Amen? What do they see when people look at me? Heads are bowed, eyes are closed.